just trying to do things. Sorry. That's awkward. Sorry, Alexei. Over to you. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yeah? Oh, well, good. Okay. So this talk is a continuation of a um, previous talk by Fimir Sophos, and I'll talk about applications to rational points. So very briefly, I need to fix some terminology. So let's call a polynomial with integer coefficients in one variable, a Bunikovsky polynomial, if um, subcondition is satisfied, so leading term is positive, and um, there is a condition for each prime L, so, so for every prime L, the reduction modulo L is not a multiple of T to the L minus T. So it's saying the same thing as um, not all values of P of T when you evaluate it on integers are divisible by um, any given prime. And so it's not hard to show that there's a positive proportion of all polynomials when you count them by sort of maximal coefficients satisfy this Bunikovsky condition. So you can think of this condition as a condition for, so, so there's, a, there's local conditions for all primes and also local condition at the infinite prime, you know, which is a positivity of the leading coefficient, for example. And Bunikovsky stated this conjecture that if P of T is also irreducible, then there are infinite many um, natural numbers, such that when you evaluate polynomial at this number, you get a prime. And he worked in the middle of the 19th century, and he worked in St. Petersburg, and he published the paper in French, which had this uh, in the uh, in the memoir of the Imperial Academy of Sciences of St. Petersburg, and he said that, um, taking into account the state of number theory of his time, proving this result needs, uh, I don't know what to say about that. <laughs> Difficulté insurmontable. Uh, yeah. And, Apparently, people tell me that it's the same today. So, but nevertheless, he says, the truth of this conjecture, I mean, they cannot be doubted. Okay, so, okay, as I said, we are going to count polynomials by height, so maximum of absolute values of coefficients, and then the theorem, which has, was explained in the previous talk to, you know, saying that 100% of Bunikovsky polynomials of a given degree of represent primes. And so, so it's, it, it's kind of a nice result, but as uh, Ephemus was explaining, it's not the same thing as to say they represent infinitely many primes, you know, where, where, you, um, where you have this result for an individual polynomial, that's equivalent. But if you only state it for 100%, that's not. So that somehow implies um, a certain rigidity, which makes application of this theorem slightly um, delicate. So, okay, I'll, I'll get back to this later. Okay, and so if he was first proved um, after a few months' work, when he's, you know, decided to do it, that this is true for a positive proportion, and later we found out that this has already known, and um, so this proved by Filosetta in 1988, so, so here's a result that Ephemius mentioned in his talk, but never stated. Uh, it's a version of theorem A, so Bunikovsky conjecture for 100%, with a, an arithmetic uh, progression condition. So there's a congruence condition. So let me, let me just uh, explain this. So suppose we have um, M0, an integer, and capital M, another integer. So D is going to be the degree, so it's fixed. And suppose you fix um, a polynomial with coefficients in Z modulo M, let's say of degree at most D, and a coprimality condition. So you evaluate it at M0, is not divisible, okay, it's not zero in Z mod M. So it's not, so if, if, if Q is represented by a polynomial of integer coefficients, this value is not divisible by M. So there's this coprimality condition, which has to be there, because the conclusion is that for 100% of Bunikovsky polynomials, P of T with this additional congruence condition and degree D, um, there's a value where 
um, Amazon. So, so if you if you evaluate p of t um, as an element of arithmetic progression, so consists of all integers congruent to m zero modulo m, then you get a prime number. So, so you can impose this sort of like weak approximation condition, if you like, morally speaking. Okay, and uh, proving this doesn't involve significantly mu uh, much more work than proving the results uh, mentioned in Euphemius' talk. So we have this, and um, so I'm going to explain how this is applied to particular kind of um, varieties and families. So I think one example which is quite popular uh, is this. So lots of papers have been um, written about this equation. So let's fix a number field k, um, let's say of degree r over q, uh, with the ring of interest OK. There's, there's norm to q, and suppose you choose a z basis of the free abelian group uh, OK. So call them omega 1, omega r, and then um, we have this norm form, so this is all well known. Um, so Z1, ZR are, are variables, and these equations uh, will be called Chatelet equations in this talk. So not equal to zero, you can ignore this. Um, so Chatelet originally considered the case where capital K is quadratic over Q and P of T is a product of two linear factors. And then gradually people start looking at more and more general versions. Um, and the affine variety given by this equation will be called Chatelet variety. So in particular, if um, in the case of so-called generalized Chatelet, whatever, if, if K over Q is quadratic, um, this is simply a conic bundle, which um, T, you, you think of T as a parameter on the base and and then this is an affine conic bundle. Um, so it's a, it's a curve, um, okay. So when we want, okay, briefly go back. So when we want to understand the arithmetic of such equations, there are two things, okay, there, there's always some, there's always a thought about brown money abstraction because this is going to play a role. What, so, okay, um, so it's good to understand it. So, when P of T is reducible, um, then something is known. So the easiest and the nicest possible case is where capital K of a Q is a cyclic extension. So in this case, things are pretty easy. Um, so the Brouwer group we are interested in is the Brouwer group of a smooth compactification of this um, affine Chatelet variety that I mentioned in the previous slide. It doesn't depend on the choice of a compactification. And it is trivial in this case, which means uh, this, is a, this terminology which says the Brouwer group is trivial if it equals the image of the Brouwer group of the ground field that is Q. There's nothing else um, but um, constant elements in the Brouwer group. Okay, so there's some calculation which is not very uh, difficult. Uh, that was done by Corotelena already and myself, which shows that in this case it's trivial. And uh, people looked also at m more difficult calculations. So if K of a Q is any extension, any finite extension, maybe non-abelian, then this group is generically trivial. So Dasheng Wei calculated the Brouwer group and he showed, I mean, okay, he didn't calculate it in all cases. I mean, that's, that's a hard al algebraic problem. It's kind of involved, you have to consider many cases and so on. But one thing is clear, namely that if capital K and the field um, defined by this polynomial P of T, so just, just a quotient field of the, the ring of polynomials in T by the principal ideal generated by P of T. So if these two fields are completely foreign to each other, which more precisely means that normal closure of K is linearly disjoint from this field. In other words, the intersection of those two fields is just Q, so if this is the case, then the group is trivial again, okay? So when we want to, to vary uh, P of T in a family, then uh, so for, for general, 
general P of T, this group is going to be trivial, so which is good news. So we don't need to like, there, there are, okay, there, there may be some surprises if P, if P of T is special, like if there is non-trivial intersection of these two fields, but in general, th there won't be any Brauermann abstraction. So since the Brauer group is trivial, there, are, there, are, there is no Brauermann abstraction. So that's, this much is clear. Okay, so here are some cases where we actually, I mean, where we know that the Hasse principle actually holds. So I continue to assume that P of T is irreducible. And so the case where we have a quadratic extension has been dealt in, in this sort of foundational paper of Coretta Renson, Six and Sondaya, 87. So if the degree of P is not very big, so if the degree is most four, then uh, the Brouwer group is trivial, and so if you know that the Brouwer abstraction is the only abstraction to rational points that, that exists in the rational points, then the Hasse principle holds. So that's exactly what happens here. And next, uh, there's a case, there's a cubic case, where both the degree of K is cubic and degree of polynomial is cubic, so this has been treated by Colleton and Salberger soon after that, using similar methods. And in the case where the degree of P is two, oh, I mean, degree one is kind of um, obvious from the point of view of existence of solutions. So if degree of C is two, this has been treated much more recently. So the important, important bit was done by Browning and Hitbrown, and uh, uh, this result was used in a, uh, in a clever way in the, in the paper by Darren Tyler Smith and Way. So, so this case is also settled, but we need to condition that P of T is general, otherwise the Brahman abstraction uh, can be non-trivial. Good, um, yeah, so in all of these papers, one proves that the Brahman the abstraction is the only abstraction to the Hasse principle, and then uses the triviality of the Brahman group to conclude the result. This is my understanding of how things go. Yeah? No, no, I don't think so. So, so, so the Brahman, I mean, they, the actual theorem were that the Brahman abstraction is the only abstraction to the Hasse principle weak approximation. And then you deduce Hasse principle where the Brauer group is trivial. No? What is the question? Yes? I don't think so, but I'm, I mean, maybe Ulrich will correct me, if, uh, but I think that they just proved that the Brahma abstraction is the only abstraction, whatever P of T of this degree. And then as a consequence of this, just as, as far, I mean, for, for, for me in this talk, I was interested in the in Hasse principle. I just wanted to mention the cases when we know Hasse principle. But I don't think it plays any role in the proof. But I mean, well, I mean, maybe. That's right. Exactly. Yeah. Okay, and just to make this m more complete, then, uh, since this talk is, uh, in the end of the day, is about Shinsley's hypothesis. If we assume this, Schinsel hypothesis H, then it is known that the Brauman abstraction is the only abstraction in the cyclic case, when K plus K of Q is cyclic. And not much is known beyond this case. So I think already the case where capital K is biquadratic, for some reason, it's quite complicated. So um, anyway, so, so no, the algebraic part, okay, let me just, uh, I mean, stress it again. So the the algebraic calculations of the, the Brouwer group are non-trivial. Right, so, so here's the theorem. So the, um, the theorem B, uh, suppose we are in a cyclic case, so capital K of Q is cyclic, we fix the degree D, and then the statement is that the positive proportion of polynomials P of T, for a positive proportion of such polynomials of given degree, the Shuttle equation has a solution in Q. So it looks kind of nice, 
but let me be kind of um, show some self-criticism at this point. And so, so it's 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 not really a very satisfying result because there is no hundred percent in it somehow. You 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 expect I mean, based on the previous talk, your expectation would have been I mean would, would normally be to expect a statement um, with hundred percent. And here's only positive repulsion. So let me kind of um, explain what. Uh, um, what goes wrong here, and also, yeah, maybe let me just explain that we can prove a result with 100% in it, but it's a, it's a bit of a weird statement, which is also not completely satisfactory. So, um, okay, so here's a, here's a here's a result. So, let me first write to put it. Let me let C be the a vector with integer coefficients, which uh, represents coefficients of a polynomial of degree d. So C is an element of z to the d, d plus one. And let's consider, so we're in the cyclic case where capital K over Q is cyclic. S is going to be the finite set of primes ramified in K. So P is the set of all Bunyakovsky polynomials of that degree. And let M be the subset of those Bunyakovsky polynomials for which we have solubility at the bad primes. So um, the Shuttle equation has a solution, psi P T P. So, and let me kind of stress that I, I want this solution to be such that the right-hand side or the left-hand side of this equation is not divisible by p. So, so this is this is kind of bad. I mean, uh, okay. So that that star here. So this star is it means a periodic unit. So it's not divisible by p. So it's, an, it's a periodic integer, not divisible by p. So so this is kind of undesirable, but we we can't do without this. And assuming this condition, there is a subset of M of density one. So this is a 100% statement. So for 100% of elements of M, the Shuttle equation is solvable in Q. All right. And um, so the, the, the reason why this is not a nice statement, is not a very nice statement, is that because the input here is, um, we're talking about integers, we're talking about integer solutions, and the output is, is, a, is a rational solution. So, so it's not like a kind of honest Hasse principle. It's a Hasse principle where we ask for something um, about integers and we produce a result about rational. And I mean, that would not be such a bad thing in itself, but, but the bad thing here is that it's non-divisibility by P condition. And let me kind of uh, just, uh, give an example of a polynomial where this is really a problem. So I will consider the, the easiest possible case where my extension is quadratic, the quadratic extension obtained by, you know, adjoining square root of minus one to Q, and the right-hand side is this very simple polynomial. And the fact is that if you look at this, um, if t is even, this is always three mod four, so it cannot be sum of two squares modulo four. And if t is odd, this is always going to be divisible by four. Uh, so modulo eight, this is always um, uh, four modulo eight. So, 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 so this equation is certainly soluble in two adic integers, but this condition is not satisfied. I, I can't find a two adic solution where the right hand side is a two adic unit. So I have to exclude, um, so this theorem doesn't apply to this case. I have to exclude polynomials with this property. And, and okay, you might say that it's just one, so, so why, why worry? But in fact, there is a whole family of positive density, which you, you can, you just add some, something like some power of two times something, and you get a positive density family. So, so I'm losing things. So that's why this uh, theorem B is not a 100% statement. Okay, so, but it's at least something. So the, the proof of this is not very hard. So it's follow, it follows a um, kind of well-trodden path. Um, and of course, the main ingredient is the Hausa norm theorem. 
But there's a, there's a little argument some, somehow which we, I mean, some, as a, curiously based on topology, where we need to use compactness of certain sets. Um, so it's not, I mean, it's, th th there is a non-trivial ingredient in it somehow. Anyway, um, so a general comment is that uh, people worked quite a lot on uh, families of varieties on, on the proportion of um, those varieties in the family w which are everywhere locally soluble. So it's a weaker, weaker question, of course. And, okay, there's a general result due to Bright, Browning, and Lachen that says that, um, you know, under, under, under reasonable conditions, which are satisfied in this case, we always have a positive proportion of varieties in the family which are everywhere locally soluble. So that's all right. And if the Hasse principle was known, then this would, impl this would imply um, theorem B. But as I, as I, I mean, I've given the list of cases where the Hasse principle is known and it's pretty restricted. So for general, for, for, high, for higher degrees of, of P, the Hasse principle is not, is not known. I mean, nothing is known beyond degree six, essentially. Okay. Um, Okay, maybe I'll move on. So, yeah, okay, so <laughs> one part of my uh, autocriticism was uh, the fact that we talk about positive proportion, not about 100%, because the ideal result would be 100% of those equations which are locally soluble, we have rational point. I mean, that'd be very nice, but uh, um, I wasn't able to do that. So, and another part of this criticism is that we require the extension to be cyclic. So. Can something be said in the case where the extension is not cyclic, like by quadratic, for example? Yes, there's a even simpler argument, which could be stated as follows. Okay, let me just state it in a general case. Let's consider number fields with the following condition. So I remind you uh, the definition of what they call extended Hilbert class field, so K plus. So it's a Ray class field of modulus equal to the union of all real places of K. In other words, K plus is the maximum Lebedian extension of K, which is unremified at all the finite places. So the, 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 the more well-known Hilbert uh, class field is unremified at the finite and infinite places. So if you forget the condition about infinite places, what you get is this extended Hilbert class field. And then, in other words, a prime P of K splits, um, well, splits completely in K plus, Precisely when uh, it, it is principle, I mean, the prime ideal is principle, and the generator is a totally positive uh, element of, of the ring of integers. So, so this totally positive is what makes the difference between K plus and the Hilbert um, class field, okay? And in these terms, I can state a, 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 another theorem, which is, uh, gives a different approach, so a different way to apply uh, analytic results to, to shuttle equations. So assume that K and K plus are both abelian, and this is quite rare actually, okay? And then for a positive proportion, we have um, a similar statement, but in this, time, in this case, the conclusion is stronger because we, we, we show that the shuttle equation is actually soluble in integers. Okay. So those two results somehow go into different directions. And let me explain that why this gives more than, in some cases, it gives more, some, some non-cyclic extensions um, are possible here. So for example, assume that K is totally imaginary and it has class number one. Then of course there's no difference between one and the other. So, okay, Q of square root of minus one, of course this is cyclic, but uh, this one is not. So this one is a um, biquadratic extension that's something new um, compared to the previous result. And uh, I mean, it is known that there are 48 of uh, biquadratic extensions of Q with class number one. So, so we, don't go, we don't get very far, but we do get a little bit beyond the class of cyclic extensions. And the proof is that easy. So um, let me explain how it goes. By Kronecker Weber, we can embed K plus. So we assume it's a billion. Therefore, we can embed it into some cyclotomic extension. So zeta in zeta m is um, m primitive m root of unity. So there exists a cyclotomic extension into which this field embeds. And then, and then of course, 
if your prime is congruent to one mod m, then it splits completely in the cyclotomic field, and therefore it splits completely in k plus. And this means that p splits in k, and on top of this, um, every prime ideal um, of the ring of integers of k of a p is generated by a totally positive uh, integer. So that's that's what it that's what it gives. <coughs> okay, and and then um, taking the norm of this x of the generator, we get exactly p because uh, because of total positivity. You know, you you look at what happens over real numbers and. Uh, you just get a product of positive numbers, and this so this has to be p. So in general, this norm could be p or minus p because it's, um, um, you know, the, the two things coincide as ideals of of q, as ideals of z. So the norm could be plus or minus p, but it, it is p because x is totally positive, and that's the end of the proof. Ah, because then by theorem a dashed, hundred percent of Bunyakovsky polynomials which are which satisfy this condition, which, which are in this arithmetic progression, represent a prime, and this prime has to be equal to one mod m, and therefore my equation is soluble. So that's, that's basically the first thing, I mean, like, like uh, you, you think about, I mean, so if, if someone tells you, you know, I can prove uh, Bunyakovsky's conjecture for 100% of polynomials, that you immediately come up, yeah, 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 I mean, this will give you this, so. Not too deep. But uh, there's a little mystery here because everybody knows that when the extension is not cyclic, um, the Hasse principle for norm equation fails. So there's, there's no Hasse norm, um, norm theorem for, for non-cyclic extension in general. And uh, I mean, some people here uh, uh, did work on this and they calculated uh, how often this fails and so on. So, so this, is, uh, this is well known. So, so in this case, um, um, fibers, which are varieties given by norm equals a constant, um, don't satisfy, I mean, th there's no Hasse principle in general, so so somehow this silly proof bypasses this difficulty, so it, 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 it's, it kind of takes you directly to your destination without first, um, you know, employing the Brownian idea for the Hasse principle idea somehow. Anyway. Okay, so that's... Uh, well, let me illustrate this with uh, an explicit calculation. So one would like to know um, maybe how often um, this, ca this can be solved. So, so we, when we say we have positive, uh, positive proportion of polynomials, this equation is soluble in integers. Well, what is this proportion? So a rather uh, direct calculation will give you the following. So let's consider a, a P of T Let's assume that P of T is Bunyakovsky polynomial of degree D, and um, <clears throat> and suppose that we, oops, and suppose that um, there is some integer m zero such that the value is one mod four. All right, and then we apply theorem a dashed to. And if we look at all possible polynomials Q of T, so Q of T, remember, is this polynomial that gives you a uh, arithmetic um, progression condition, this, this congruence condition. So we look at all possible Q of T of degree at most D, um, such that uh, th th there's, there's, some, there's some integer M0 where the value is one mod four. So, so you look, you know, you 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 break you break your situation into into those disjoint families into which you apply theorem a dashed, and as a consequence, you get that for hundred percent of polynomials, there is um, um, m congruent to m zero in this arithmetic progression, such that this is a prime, and and so. The right-hand side is a prime congruent to one mod four, and of course this equation is then soluble. So, well, you calculate, and the answer is this. So if d is at least equal to three, the proportion of <coughs> polynomials p of t so this, such that my equation is soluble is at least this number. So, so here, this fraction uh, is taking care of situation at two, and then there's a product of a primes 
three, five, and so on. So they all kind of, and so this condition is precisely the Bunyakovsky condition at a prime P of Rh P. And here we take into account this more stringent condition at two. So you get this answer. Well, of course, it's a very rough estimate because you could do a lot of other things. You could put, for example, two in front of this polynomial and then you get another family. And so, so, so you, 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 you absolutely can do better. So, but, so, but maybe you, you can do better by a little bit. So, um, so this all asks for further thinking and maybe better constructions and then, but I, I hope I kind of, at least, at least I try to explain here uh, that applying this result is, I mean, the result is a bit rigid for application. You know, it's, it's not a geometric result. It's a result for a specific family of polynomials. So, so in geometry, you like work with any family or, you know, like a variety and, you know, so it's, it's kind of hard because you were, you're kind of attached to a specific family and then it needs maybe a new idea to, to make the result more adaptable for, I mean, more flexible for application. Anyway, uh, okay, so let me also illustrate how Schinzel's hy um, hypothesis with probability one, which uh, Ephemus was talking about, could be applied to you know, slightly more general equations. So for this purpose, let me call a entiple of polynomials a Schinzel entiple. If, oops, sorry. If, um, if we have a similar condition to the previous case, um, satisfied by the product of this polynomial. So P1, Pn is not divisible by T to the L minus T. And then the leading coefficient of each polynomial has to be positive. So let's call them this a Schindler entiple. So Schindler's conjecture, okay, was discussed already. Um, it says that if you have a Schindler entiple where each polynomial is irreducible, then there are infinitely many values where you these polynomials have simultaneously prime values when evaluated at them. And the only known case is Dirichlet theorem and unknown case include the twin primes conjecture. So, okay, we call the height of an entiple the maximum heights of individual polynomials. And then there's a version of, so this is something worse th that uh, if you just mentioned but never stated. So. Let me explain how this goes. This is very, very similar to what we had for one polynomial, just um, basically the same statement with for n polynomials. So fixed degrees, d1, dn, fix also integers m0 and capital M. And suppose we are given polynomials q1, qn, um, with coefficients modulo m of degrees at most di. And we have this coprimality condition that I was sort of complaining about in, in my example, namely that the product of QIs evaluated at M0 is you know, coprime to M, so it's not zero modulo M. And then for 100% of Schindler entiples, P1, Pn, satisfying, you know, of given degrees, and satisfying this concrete condition, there exists a, um, an element of the surface progression where PIs, uh, where you, if you evaluate PIs in this, in, at, this, at this natural number, you get, you get primes. So each of, each of each value is a prime. Okay, so this is the main analytic result. And as Ephemius explained, this is a consequence of 100% um, um, version of the Batenhout conjecture. So I will not talk about this. And if M is one, that the theorem C says precisely that Schindler's hypothesis H holds with probability one. So, okay, so we can consider the same equations before, but now that the right-hand side is a product of polynomials, and we get the same statement. Now you will notice that in this case, this is not the case. So when I when I when I have given a list of cases where the Brouwer group is trivial, this was not mentioned, of course. And of course, the Brouwer group can be non-trivial in this case. And and so we had to brutally like, impose the triviality of the Brouwer mining conditions. But that's not very hard to do. Um, so okay, maybe I should say a couple of words. Yeah, I think I have time. So. Uh, how you prove this result and also the previous result. 
it's um, <clears throat> it's very very easy to since since we only care about positive proportion, we could be we can afford to be really kind of rough, and then we um, it's very easy to take care of solubility at the bad primes, so those primes which are ramified in K. For example, you just could consider polynomials congruent to a number, not to polynomial, but just to a number which is, um, uh, I mean, <coughs> sorry, <coughs> modulus sufficiently high power of P. So if, if P is one of those critical primes, you, you, you just, uh, th th there will be a power of that P such that if your polynomial is congruent to one, I mean, to, num to number one, modulo this, this power of P, then, then um, this periodic integer is, is a div power. So the, you, you could do it like this, for example. And then, of course, if it's a div power, then it's a norm for an extension of degree D. So, so, so clearly a positive proportion uh, condition at critical, find the many critical primes is easy to satisfy. And then, you just work in, um, we, 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 we also assume that, you know, something like this, a solubility such that the right-hand side is not divisible by P, and then you can apply the theorem, and then it gives you a prime, and then a little sort of global reciprocity argument will quickly show that the equation is soluble. So that, that's what happened in this case, and in, in this case it works just the same way, because we also ensure that the brown Brownian condition is trivial, and this is not. This is equally easy to ensure. So, I mean, so because it, it's just the same, um, it's kind of the same. It has the same nature. All right. So, so that's no surprise. Um, yeah. So this, this is what I just said, and the Brownian condition is easy to ensure because it is uh, the Brown group is vertical in this case. So the calculation did, uh, which I mentioned already, shows that. Um, the, 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 the Brouwer elements, non-trivial Brouwer elements, come from um, central simple algebras uh, over the field Q of T. So they, they only depend on, on T, and, and they're given by explicit classes, and these classes are easy to work with. So, so by, by demanding that um, P's, I mean my polynomials are congruent to one modulus such a high power of every critical prime, I also ensure that the Brownian condition is satisfied. So. Okay, so let's go to another application. So this time we'd like to talk about more general. So, so remember that if K was quadratic of a Q, I said this is a conic bundle surface. So let's consider more general conic bundle surfaces. So I will fix some notation. So N1 and 2 and 3 are going to be integers such that N1 and N2 are positive, and N3 is non-negative. N is their sum, and then, and then I have some non-zero integers, A1 and 2, A3, and I fix the degrees, and consider the following equation. So it's a diagonal um, conic. It's a family of diagonal conics parametrized by T, where coefficients are sort of these sort of generic polynomials, so the products of generic polynomials. So a certain number of polynomials here, there, and there, and a1, a2, a3 are just integers. And again, I mean, uh, the statement is that for a positive proportion of n-tuples, so here we have like um, n-tuples where n is just the sum of the total number of polynomials involved here, and for a positive proportion of those n-tuples, this equation is soluble in Q. Okay, um, so, so this is of course not covered by the previous case. Um, the previous case would, I mean, we would get the previous case if um, uh, that would be a constant and that would be a constant, but I specifically want this to be, um, to exclude this by asking that two coefficients, at least two coefficients should be non-constant. Okay, and here again, I mean, you can prove, I don't think it's in the literature, but I mean, it's not hard, that the, for general intervals, the Brouwer group is trivial, but again, for general, I mean, of course, you, you'll have examples where the Brouwer group is non-trivial, but for general ones, this is, this is gonna be fine. 
and I think I think you really need condition of this condition for this. Because um, as we've seen before, like in the Shuttle case, if uh, if we have three coefficients such that constant, constant, and then a product of polynomials, then the Brouwer group is non-trivial. Okay? And in the paper, this theorem D is proved using um, Pete Brown's bound for bilinear sums with Jacobi symbols, which is quite complicated. I mean, I mean, it is for me. Uh, so um, when I was preparing this talk, I kind of realized that probably it's not needed. So there's a, there's a, there's a more algebraic proof that uh, generalizes this theorem D and theorem B, which I mentioned before, not the funny one with uh, where we immediately get uh, integer solutions in the beginning, but um, the previous one. So you could put them in the same setting and 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 do without Hugh Brown somehow for this for this result, and 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 we get also a more general. So basically, the idea is that you can replace conics by any variety satisfying the Husserl principle, like like in papers on vibration methods, um, which are which are many, I think. So one 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 should be able to do this. I mean, the details are not yet written, but uh, it it seems it seems it seems all right. Okay, so. Okay, let me just explain like some concrete application of this. So consider the case when P1, P2, P3, so I only have three polynomials. So each coefficient is irreducible, unlike in more general uh, equation on the previous slide. And <clears throat> they all have degree two. So in this case, we get the del Pezzo surface of degree two. I mean, to be more precise, uh, this equation, um, I mean, this, this variety needs to be properly compactified, so, so geometry has to be, to, to be sorted out, but it's, it's, um, it works, it's fine. So we get a defense of degree two, and so theorem D says that positive proportion of these have a, have a, have a rational point. And of course, uh, once again, I just repeat, the, if we knew that the brown money abstraction is the only would be the only, the only abstraction on del Pezzo surfaces of degree two of this of this particular form, then we would be fine. But I think we don't. As far as I know, we don't. So, because if we, if we knew it, we could deduce the result from Bright Browning Lachlan theorem, um, which says that the positive proportion have uh, um, members in this family have an R uh, everywhere locally soluble. But it doesn't seem to be known. But of course, we can go also. Let's look at some other cases. So, so for com just for comparison, if if in this equation here we replace one of the polynomials by a constant, so degrees are zero, two, and two, then this is the Pezzo surface of degree four with a conic bond structure. And for this, for let alone prove the um, that the Brownian abstraction is the only one, quite some time ago. But uh, somehow, you know, this was a time when people were able to to prove these results without using any analysis. But uh, it somehow gets stalled. I mean, this 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 doesn't go very far. So, I mean, some cases some cases yield, but some other cases resist. So, um, so okay, and and beyond six. Uh, so there was a, there was a paper by Swinton Dyer which treated Shuttle equation where the right hand side had degree six was a product, I think, of um, polynomial degree two and degree four. But um, but beyond this, uh, beyond degree six, nothing is known. Whereas whereas these methods, uh, amazing, these amazing methods on average uh, work for any n. So, and I think I've reached um, everything I had to say. If I'm I'm, I'm a little early, but uh, maybe we have time for questions. So are there any questions for Alex? Thank you. 
Yeah, 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 yeah. We should do the two hours. Yeah, nice. Oh, I expect to be positive. Okay, cool. Because the Brahman condition is very explicit. It's, it's essentially as explicit as this equation itself. So it's just, a, it's, it's all stated in terms of this cyclic algebra. So, you know, some sim products of symbols and it's, it's, it's completely elementary in a way. So, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's going to be fun. I'm guessing the answer to this is going to be no, but uh, can you say anything about your positive proportions? Yeah, well, I mean, uh, we, we've been very, <laughs> I was going to say, we've been very careless. And then, um, because the, the moment we realized that we don't reach 100%, <laughs> I just got afraid we lost motivation. Uh, so, yeah, of course, it's could be, it could be made precise. So, okay, that, that, that silly calculation that I showed you here, yeah. So that, you know, gives an example, gives an idea, on, because, um, because it's sort of not very hard to calculate it. And, uh, yeah, I mean, it's, I mean, what we do is so completely explicit, yeah, and we, all, we can just write down these numbers, I mean, yeah. And, and we can probably improve, but, I mean, it seems to be like pointless because <laughs> we're not getting to 100 percent. So we can just, uh, you know, go from I don't know, 56 to I don't know, 57.5. But I mean, not something like this. But it's it's not very fun. Yeah. But you don't kind of get close to I don't know being comparable with a proportion uh, like this sort of, or you know, to be able to say. Yeah, we should we should do that, but then maybe I should we should ask the experts. I mean. In each case here, uh, is it known what is the proportion of ever local soluble? Or, or maybe in some cases. So which are cases where it is known, right? Because, because it's non trivial exercise to, to do this sort of local densities, right? Uh -huh. Well, quadratic, okay, um, of course, quadratic. Yeah. Let's not be too ambitious. Yeah. Yeah, I think I think it's kind of messy exercise to write down because you need to do these local calculations and you need to just solve many equations. Yes, they work with cubic cubic curves in P two that sort of thing. Yeah, I mean this. Yeah, this, these calculations are not. I mean, they're you know you have to work. <laughs> Okay, well, if there yeah, are there's one more. Ah. Oh. Um, possibly, yeah. Yeah, 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 that's a good suggestion. Yeah, we, we somehow didn't think about it. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Yeah, yeah it, it should be just the same. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's strange. Like, I mean, these proofs are not hard at all. I mean, I, I feel like a bit, a bit guilty that, uh, uh, you know, th those massive analytic machinery uh, that required to prove the analytic statements is not like. Um, Complemented by equally impressive uh, algebraic machinery, but uh, I mean, I don't know. And blame it on me. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, maybe that's a, maybe that's a good idea. Yeah, maybe that's a good idea. That's a good thought. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, because universal torsos, I mean, I mean, some sort of torsos, yeah, yeah, okay, which are close to universal, probably vertical, I mean, they're, they're easy to write down, and then, yeah, and then, yeah, well, I'm not sure. Well, yeah, well, I need to think, I need to think. It's a good question, but I need to think.